Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for stopping by for this one. It is the last show, 2018, and this year-end show has somehow developed a theme of what we call in my hood, real talk. Last year, I chatted with a man named Gilbert Bates about love, the three levels of consciousness, primal pain, and primal therapy, which got a tremendous response. So with that in mind, we return to the subject of love to close out the Gregorian calendar year that has been 2018. And our guest for this one is Dr. Amin Zadeh, who published a book in 2017 called The Forgotten Art of Love, What Love Means and Why It Matters. Amin is a cardiologist and professor at Johns Hopkins University. He has authored more than 100 scientific articles and is an editor of scholarly books in the field of medicine. And besides medicine, he has a strong interest in philosophy, with a particular focus on mending its ideas with concepts from biology and the sciences. Now, in his book, The Forgotten Art of Love, Amin revisits psychologist Eric Fromm's The Art of Loving and examines love through the lenses of biology, philosophy, history, religion, sociology, and economics to fill in critical voids in Fromm's classic work and to provide a contemporary understanding of love and a look at its role in every aspect of human existence. There's a lot packed into this conversation, including love as a religion, love's similarity to creativity, what Amin thinks of polygamy, and so much more. Just a raw, honest chat about love. I haven't said during the conversation that this is nothing really too groundbreaking, and it isn't. But that's what I like about it. It's just real talk about the one subject that seems to continue to elude us, both individually and collectively, especially collectively. It's been a trying year for some of you out there. I know it has been for me at times. And with that in mind, there is no Patreon extension here. This is the full show for everyone. So I hope by the end of it, you walk away with at least a reminder and some reassurance. We are deep diving love with Dr. Amin Zadeh, who's in the house right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year's 1990. Welcome to a culture. Dr. Amin Zadeh. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. Definitely, yeah. I am very happy and so grateful that you're here to talk about what we're here to talk about. So thank you so much for taking the time. And before you get going, you know, let me give you a, a small peek into how I read books and prepare for this show. I go through them with a highlighter and I highlight everything I want to talk about. It doesn't matter if it's a physical copy or an ebook. I'm constantly just highlighting quotes and passages. And I can safely say that each book, I highlight probably a quarter to a third of it. And then I go back and I form questions around the things that I picked out. When I was done with your book, I looked back and I had highlighted the whole thing, all the words. <laughs> so we have a lot to talk about. And of course, I'm exaggerating, but only slightly, only slightly. So I think the best place to start, though, is with your journey to this book. You know, you're a cardiologist writing about love. And I guess it began 
more than 30 years ago when you picked up a book on your parents' bookshelf called The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm. You actually wrote that, quote, as a young adult, I hope this was a new version of the Kama Sutra. And I eagerly pulled the book <laughs> off the shelf. And after overcoming my disappointment at finding a rather sober analysis of the phenomenon of love instead of practical instructions on love making, I found myself drawn into the author's arguments I read for hours in growing fascination, end quote. So tell us a bit about this book and what your impressions of it were way back then and why you found it so fascinating. Sure, yeah, no, I have to admit that uh, Eric's From the Art of Loving really was a, was a trigger and uh, probably too many. I mean, this book was very provocative. It's still considered a classic in, in, in that uh, field of literature. And uh, for those um, who don't know it, it it's uh, Eric Fromm was a you know, quite renowned psychologist, uh, also a, a philosopher, essentially uh, interested also in sociology. So he wrote a number of books, but the art of loving, in many ways, stood out because it essentially challenged a view on love, which was uh, quite. Um, widespread at that time and actually still today. And I think a lot of my motivation to wrote my book was I felt like, well, he had a lot of good points and uh, they seem to be somewhat forgotten in these day and age. And, and, and I think they're worthwhile remembering. Uh, so essentially what, what, what Fromm said was like, well, the kind of love which you commonly associate with uh, is really not the love he feels is is true love uh, and essentially one one big aspect was to differentiate between the feelings of when we fall in love compared to the um to the state of love and uh, so he made pretty clear at least in his mind that he felt that you know when when we have that initial phase so when we when we engage in a in a relationship and you know we have these really overwhelming feelings uh, and uh, overpowering feelings i mean and these are the feelings which are typically also portrayed in in movies and in in books and these are the very powerful feelings you know we crave now he points out that these that these powerful feelings you know, after a while dissipate. You know they they don't last. I think anybody in in who had like uh, long term relationships and has and have to probably has to admit that even though you still love a person wholeheartedly, the intensity of your feelings are typically not the same as they were in the few first uh, first years. And then there are a lot of reasons for that, and we're gonna probably gonna go into those. Uh, but but his Fromm's contribution was to say, well, you know, there are distinct differences about what we call love. And this early phase, he said that this is, this is kind of more like along the lines of an infatuation. And you have these feelings, uh, but they don't, they don't last. And so what we really want is lasting love. And he said, lasting love is a whole different, almost a whole different entity. It is something where we have to, in, in contrast to, the early feelings when we fall in love, we have to really put our mind towards. So he felt it is an art, meaning that, you know, you have to learn something about this art and you have to develop skills. And uh, I mean, again, and that was obviously somewhat contrary to what most people perceived of love. So he, his book was a, you know, a very analytical description of what, what he felt that love is and what, what love is, is not. And again, I mean, I was uh, I was a teenager at that time, and my impression of love was pretty much like everybody else's, like all these great feelings, and and didn't think much beyond that. Uh, so when I read from, I was really intrigued that he had a much deeper, you know, vision of of love, and uh, it also rang true to me because it kind of addressed a lot of these issues which people struggle with in relationships. You know, the, the issue that after a few years they may not feel the same and then feel like well maybe our love has come to an end and uh, while from power points out well it really hasn't come to an end it really hasn't really started yet you know that's the part where you really have to put your mind into uh, to, uh, to a relationship and provide effort so that was how i think many things triggered and and this book ever since stayed with me uh, and I always felt like in, in the back of my mind, well, there's, there's probably more to say to that. And, and plus, you know, from wrote this book 
in the 1950s and, and, and there's clear evidence that it was written from a viewpoint of you know, the uh, knowledge, scientific knowledge of that time, but also yet a strong uh, religious viewpoint. And, uh, and we made in the last few decades, we made major strides in, in understanding more about law from a scientific standpoint. There are a lot of things going on in the mind, in the process of loving. And, and so I, I, while I pursued my career as a, as a physician and uh, actually a scientist, um, this aspect always stayed with me. And I, I thought it was really interesting in how knowledge accumulated. And so eventually I felt like, well, maybe I can take part of the essences of Fromm's book. Uh, some of the aspects which I really thought they were, really, they were very accurate and helpful and then expand on these and, uh, and take his concept into the 21st century, look at how his concepts held up you know, with, with current science and uh, in many ways kind of also look at to the aspect a little bit more broader and not from one angle, but trying to look at love from very different angles. Uh, one angle is, is clearly science, but then there is philosophy, there's religion, there's sociology. So I really was I'm trying just to look at love, love from, from all these uh, aspects. But I have to say, though, I think one of the key motivations for me just to, to write was also personal experience. And I guess the realization, like everybody else has, you know, that, that love is central to our existence. I mean, it's... We all know that on some level, because we, we all there's nobody on this planet to whom love is not important. We all recognize that the love is important and it's probably vital. But at the same time, we spend a lot of time in our lives dealing with other things. Obviously, we have to make a living, we study or, or learn skills to to maintain our lives and to provide a family. I mean, these are all obviously vital things, but even beyond that, we're we spending a lot of time in our lives on, on other things, but maybe not as much on, on trying to understand love. Uh, and if it's so vital for us, if it's so critical for our lives, you know, I think it's almost peculiar why we're not trying to understand love more deeply because, you know, at the end of the day, we all want love in our lives. I mean, that's, you know, it was another really, really important uh, aspect to me. And, and, so it's the, the interface of all these fields, and particularly philosophy and, and science, uh, religion, which, which makes it so fascinating. So we all have basically priorities in our lives. I mean, our lives are made up of day-to-day, minute-to-minute priorities. So how do we spend our time? Next day, what are we going to do? So we make in our mind up you know, what we feel is, is our priority. And... Uh, to me, it felt like, well, if, if we want love to be a priority, you know, we have to kind of find ways to make time it and, and, and to dedicate effort to it. Also, of all the things I felt to be a priority in my life, I felt that, that spending time to understand love is, is something very valuable. So obviously, it's a lot of work to, to write a book. I mean, I spent years and years researching and writing and, and since I have a full-time job otherwise. <laughs> so it wasn't easy. Uh, so many of my colleagues were like wondering, how, how did I do that uh, with, with the full schedule as a physician and, and, and scientist? But I felt it was a priority for me. So I, I coughed out uh, time, particularly at night, instead of watching television and uh, the kids were in bed and so I, I you know, just took you know, a few hours every day and uh, kept, kept on writing. So I'm very glad that I, I completed it. So that's one thing off my bucket list for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, back to the Fromm book just for a moment. You know, you said that you found his understanding of love compelling, but that you also felt he didn't get it entirely right and that several aspects of his arguments and the way that he defined love, that they struck you as incorrect or at least incomplete. So when you got into the book and you were kind of formulating your own definition of love, what was that? How would you describe love to somebody who asks you, you know, what is love? Well, uh, I get to this in a second. Yeah, so, but essentially what, what bothered me in, in Fromm's uh, analysis was that he was extremely 
analytical and intellectual about love and kind of like almost dismissive of the emotions. So he went, in my mind, to the other extreme. So most people, I think, when they think of love, they think of the emotions. And then many people even say, well, love is an emotion. I would disagree with that, but I think emotions are part of love. But again, I think most people very closely connect powerful emotions with love. From, on the other hand, basically went out to say, well, love is essentially it's just a power of the mind. And it is something, you know, intellectually you acquire and, and then you can apply. And he, again, he didn't talk much about emotion at all in this book. So what I felt was, well, there's probably truth in the middle. Or, I mean, at least I think the, the emotional con concept or the emotional components of love cannot be ignored, clearly. They're very powerful emotions uh, with love. But how do they really fit in? How do they fit in with Fromm's concept, which also we, I felt like you know has a lot of merits. So the way I, I perceive it is that one follows the other, that that when you focus your mind indeed on on love, and, and it's really true that you can make your mind create emotions. And at the end of the day, all our perception and everything, what we perceive, feel, experience is our mind. It's pretty clearly evident, you know, when we alter our mind with diseases or drugs or medications, uh, we can induce powerful changes in the way we perceive the world. So at the end of the day, emotions are created in our brain. And, you know, everybody knows that. I mean, if you watch a movie and you see something and the brain processes it and then creates with that emotions. So at the same time, it is true that if you are, you can direct your mind towards loving, meaning that you don't need passively absorbing impressions like you do in the movies, you actually can focus your mind such that you feel true love you know, towards other people. And the, the key aspect there is, though, that you do you know, feel these, these, these emotions. And I think, again, the, the key thing is that they follow what the process is in the brain. Now, sometimes that's subconscious. You know, we don't, or most of the time, it's subconscious. We don't even recognize this. You know, many things would be experiencing what, what happening in our daily life or minute to minute, we're completely unaware of. Uh, and so we love the same thing. You know, we're not really dissecting and we don't really analyzing or how often what is happening in our brain. And the key or well, one key distinction, again, between the falling in love and in the infatuation phase in the early few years and the long-term love, which is the lasting love, is that early on, this is triggered with our notion. We basically see a person or we have some interaction and then subconsciously our brain goes through a lot of algorithms and, uh, and based on some prior experience uh, on cultural influences and all uh, genetics, uh, you know, it, it happens so that it clicks and oh, now all of a sudden we have you know, this, this emotion for somebody that, that's falling in love. Uh, so in that case, it is just like an unconscious mechanism. We don't have to do anything about it. But again, this is transient. It, 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 it only lasts for a few years, if at all. But the, the, the lasting love, the love we actually can all have, and that's, I think, the amazing and, and really fascinating aspect of it. We really can all experience love essentially anytime we want. The catch is it is very hard because our mind is not easily focused because you know, we're living for many, many years and having certain patterns and uh, they are very difficult to change. Essentially, our brain is constantly distracted by other, what we perceive as desirable actions or, or, or impressions or stimulations. Uh, so what it is, is a lot of this understanding about, about love and how it works, you know, is understanding our mind, you know, is understanding, you know, what, what is psychology, what is, uh, what is neuroscience, you know, how all these things work uh, and they do actually help 
getting us to what we want. But again, the, the difficult part is it's just much harder to put it into practice. It is possible. It's much harder to put in practice. So the, the mind really is, and we are as, as, as human beings, like, like most beings, you know, we are very easily driven by pleasure stimulation. So a lot of these things, we're getting rewarded, you know, we're getting rewarded for eating, we're getting rewarded for sleeping, we're getting rewarded for playing with our internet, we are being rewarded for sex. There's a lot of things what we do, our brain gives us an, a, a positive feedback and say, all right, you know, you get a little, you know, everybody knows about endorphin release and now many people know about dopamine release. So these are transmitters, uh, little messenger molecules in our brain and they stimulate the perception of of euphoria in our brain. Uh, and that happens all the time. It happens all the time or during the day that we be motivated. All right, you know, uh, even our work, you know, we get something accomplished and the, the act of accomplishment gives us a little endorphin release and something like this. So that's why it is very difficult to focus our, on our, our brain on something specific because constantly our brain sees something or is, is, is stimulated by something and wants to get the, the reward for that. The challenge with, with love is that in order to really maintain love, you have to kind of push these other things aside because as soon as you kind of engage your mind in something, you know, which the mind wants you to go, then you, you kind of lose the focus on love and that kind of takes away your satisfaction and, and, and emotion you get with love. So and essentially, it's a constant competition. And to some people, the the competition is too hard. I mean, the satisfaction they get, let's say, you know, from sex with somebody else as their partner, this this kind of stimulation is so euphoric for them that they say, all right, you know, I cannot resist my temptation to do that. And it's a drastic uh, example. But in a day-to-day basis, you know, many of those things apply. I mean, if you have a partner and you spend you know, your life with or at least some time with, even on a day-to-day basis, there are lots of things the brain says, well, I want to go golfing or I want to spend time with work. I want to spend time with this. And these things take away time. You focus on the love for your partner. So you make in your mind, you have to say, all right, no, no, my priority is my love, my relationship. And if you do that, you, know, you will get a lot of satisfaction and, and reward uh, from it. But for many people, this is difficult, I would say, for most people. I mean, some people, they learn these patterns to focus on relationships and love much earlier in life, you know, largely from their parents or from other examples. But for most of us, these things remain a struggle. Now, I don't want to finish the thought without giving you what I think is the at least my version of, of a definition of love, is it's the urge and the continuous effort for the happiness and well-being of somebody. And so with that, I wanted to emphasize that love has both. It has this urging component that if you, you feel like that you really want this person or this somebody or it could, could be also your pet or it doesn't have to be human. You want that to be happy. You know, that, that's an, you know, there's an urgency there. There's like a, a feeling inside, like, you know, you, you want to protect this person. You want to make sure it's well and not just well, but even more than that, you know, joyful and happy. And so there is this urge, but there's also the commitment portion, which is often neglected. There's a continuous effort for that. And that is a critical critical component of love, that, that love really has that constantly, again, effort just to maintain that. And that comes back to what we just discussed, that, that particularly in the long run, other aspects or interests in your brain may be competing with that, with your urge and, and, and continuous effort for the well-being of, uh, of somebody. And so it takes the effort just to refocus and say, all right, what is it really what matters to me? And that brings up another extremely important aspect of love and why 
I think it's so fascinating and so central to our existence because it gets us to the point of the purpose in life. What is it what I want to do in this life? You know, who am I? I mean, I have been given certain time, who knows what, on this planet. So what am I going to do with this? And so love is an answer and it's a very powerful answer. And I think in my mind and in the minds of, of many philosophers and uh, religious leaders, it is the, it is the key. It is the key to life because it, it answers this question. Uh, if you are saying, all right, well, all what I want to do in this life is I want to make sure that at least one other person had a better life than I, that's purposeful living. So yeah. you do something which you feel gives meaning to this life. So the disconnection just to, to realize the love is so central to our, our purpose gives, I think, more motivation to understand love and just to understand the mechanisms, how we can keep it in our life. Because again, everybody, I think, wants to keep love in their lives. And, but we struggle. Many people struggle with it. And everybody struggles. I mean, I'm not an exception. I have also the same, I mean, my mind works the same way. But I'm, you know, I, have to, I, have, I have learned now to be mindful of these things and just like making decisions and you know, saying, all right, well, if I have the urge just to do something and it's not related to the well-being and, and happiness of, of, of my loved ones, then I think twice. Is it really necessary for me to do this? You know, certain things are necessary. I have to work and I have to make a living. I cannot 24-7 uh, dedicate time to my loved ones. Uh, I would love to, but I, I, I cannot. But by being very cognizant and, and mindful of, of my activities, I, I try to maximize what I can spend, what effort and, 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 and focus I can spend you know, for my loved ones and while minimizing other activities which, which are not serving that, that, that purpose. Yeah, and just to that point of making the effort, you mentioned in the book that well, there's so many things that we focus on, like our hobbies or our jobs, and that you know we spend all this time doing things like playing video games or you know playing on our phones. That you know if we just put that down for a few minutes or an hour or two, and instead of devoting it to you know Facebook, we devoted it to our partner or our children, we would just have a, a totally different life experience. And I thought that was a you know, it's a very simple point to make. It's not like it's a groundbreaking point either. It's very obvious that you just need to spend more time with yourself and with the people who, I guess you would say that you love in your life. Yeah, and that's exactly right, Ryan. I mean, it's not like revolutionary. I mean, that's the, exactly the point. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows, you know, yes, you should more tip, spend more time with your loved ones. You shouldn't. Everybody knows that. The key thing is, in my book, I'm trying to explain why that is different, uh, difficult, you know, for the reasons I'm going to talk, I would have, it comes back to how our, our mind works. And by understanding how our mind works, the hope is just, just you know, for folks to just to uh, see that, that, there is, that there is a way to deal with this. The issue is it is hard. It is very difficult. And it is like, like everything else in, 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 in life. You get great results if you are put effort to it. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, almost nothing comes served on a silver platter. Now, here is one of the key confusions about love because the falling love portion does come on a silver platter. It comes effortless. And that's why I think people struggle with love also because there is a confusion about, well, you fall in love easily. You know, you just, it happens at least easily, I say, in the sense that you don't have to do anything about it. You have really not much control over it. It happens. Uh, and then it's there. All of a sudden, you have these powerful emotions, and you don't have to do anything for them. They're, just, they're there, and they just carry you. They carry you for weeks and months. And that's also a reason why we're craving that so much, because it's one of those things which are effortless for everything else. We do have to work hard, but, but when we fall in love everything is wonderful and essentially you're just there for the ride. But the, again, the, the disappointing aspect is that this phase does not last. Uh, and it's now scientifically shown, we, we know exactly kind of patterns. Uh, we, don't, we don't know exactly constellation of 
all the hormones, but we know that there are a bunch of hormones released early on in the falling in love phase and that they eventually decrease in the intensity, the, the blood levels. And so we, we understand it much better now from a scientific standpoint, but we do know essentially this, this phase comes to an end. So people, when they talk about or think about love, they want this early phase to last forever uh, because it's the effortless phase and it's, you know, it's powerful and it's beautiful. It doesn't. So we only get this first few years for free, and then we have to step in. Then we have to kind of make it make it happen. And that's where often things fall apart. You know, there's statistically clearly evidence for that couples break up, particularly after three to four years, uh, more frequently than other times, uh, because that's where the falling in love phase uh, uh, often ends. But again, it's under, under control. You know, we, we have the power just to make love last. We have to put the effort in. And again, this is difficult. It's difficult in a different ways to do it. You know, like you know, I describe in the book and, and people have different general feelings about it. And, and, and it gets into also, you know, general aspects of life, you know, how we want to lead our life and some people use uh, religion as guidance that helps them, which essentially is a way to to guide your mind, you know, because if you have very strong convictions about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what is it what you do in your mind? You say, all right, this is okay and this is not okay. And the teachings of religions, they are very specific in, in this regard. You know, uh, love your neighbor and religion actually is in many ways instructive of how to learn how to love. You know, if you, if Jesus says, love your neighbor, he tells you like, you know, regardless who your neighbor is, you should love your neighbor. So that kind of implies your effort that you have to, in your mind, say, well, even though I may not have liked that neighbor, I have to find a way in my mind to overcome this. So that, that indicates, you know, the same concept that we have to use our mind or, or get our mind to do what we want. And in the case of religion, you're using concentration, prayers, a lot of prayers, you're losing sermons, you know, you're losing studying. And, but, but essentially that's what you do. You know, you take your brain and your mind and, and focuses on something. Uh, I mean, Jesus obviously goes further and he says, like, you should, you should even love your enemies. Again, showing like, wow, this is something you know, most people to be thinking that, how can I do that? You know, that would be completely counterintuitive. Uh, but the, the concept is just, yeah, just to kind of challenge your mind, to challenge your mind and get it out of its regular patterns and just thinking, you know, don't think of this person as an enemy. Think of this person differently. And if you get your mind to think about this person differently, all of a sudden you see, well, he this is not an enemy. This is a person. This is a human being like I. So it's all there in our mind. And it's all there for us to, to grasp. Again, the issue is it is hard. That's why not everybody can do it. Many people struggle. Uh, and we have to find our, our path to that. Uh, religion is one path. Meditation is another one. Many people find that strength and focus in meditation, which, which is exactly the same thing. You know, you using your, or not using, you getting your mind to focus and to focus on something which you want and to, and, and to have your mind understand to see things in a more loving way. Whereas, you know, your, your typical pattern may have been to see things differently. You know, the, the, the mind obviously has a lot of um, uh, is, is put in very different directions, you know, and, and they are from from point of evolution, a lot of patterns which are directed at our uh, survival, and some of them are just self-preservation. Uh, so these things, they, they are very much present, and, and we have to, our mind has to deal with it. So sorting out these things in our mind and, and saying, all right, this is really what we believe is, is the most important thing is not easy, but again, it can be done. Uh, meditation is also not easy. Uh, many, many people also struggle with meditation because it's time, effort, and our society 
is not very conducive to these things you now, particularly in these day and age. And we're getting now to some of the challenges in particularly in, in recent years. Um, our, our mind is even ever more being distracted. Uh, we, we already mentioned something uh, like social media, etc. From the minute we wake up, many of us, we just information distractions nonstop. You know, we're switching on our phone, if we're getting messages, text messages, getting emails, uh, we're looking at social media, we're looking at uh, the news. I mean, there's constant, constant, constant uh, information and constant distraction. And many feel, well, we don't have to, I have, not, I have no time to meditate. That takes like 20 minutes out of my day. You know, I, I cannot do it. But this is just a priority we make. We're saying, well, the other things are more important to me. I have no time for it because other things are more important for me. It's just a decision. But if we feel that this is important, that, that uh, developing our, our mind and finding you know, peace and uh, contentment and finding more love in us, if you feel this is this is a priority, we make this time. You know, we're saying, all right, no, no, this, I, these 20 minutes a day, I, I need them and they are very important to me. But is it, it, is getting, it is getting harder. But the concept is all the same. The concept is that our mind is being confronted with a lot, a lot, a lot of stimulation. And it is up to us to choose what stimulation we follow and, and what priority uh, priorities we make uh, it's it's again it's all there it's not easy and it's not something people like to hear because we like it to be easy we like the face of, of falling in love early on because it's effortless everybody uh, would like to have beautiful things without a lot of effort but uh, again unfortunately this is not reality reality is that for many of these accomplishments we we do have to put in some effort. Definitely, yeah. I mean, it is very difficult to quiet down all the noise in modern society to make room for things like meditation and exercise sometimes and proper nutrition and love too, you know, I guess falls into there as well. So, you know, there are a few things that I've struggled with in the love department, more about the ideas of love. And one of them is are there different types of love? Because when I say, oh, I love my dog or my cat, or I love my friends, and I love my family, and I love my spouse or my partner? Am I referring to the same type of love? So I'm just wondering from your perspective, are there different types of love? Well, it's a great question. So here, I think it is important to distinguish between love and relationships. Uh, and I think that's, that's very important uh, because these things are often confused. Uh, often we actually use love synonymously with, with relationships. I, I believe we need to keep them separately. So to, to make that clear, you can have a relationship with somebody which contains love. And, it, and typically love is the critical component of a relationship. But you know, they are relationships, clearly. They don't have love. I mean, the couples have been married for a long time and they uh, drifted apart. And they just you know, they, they really don't love each other anymore, but they stay together uh, in a relationship because of you know, various reasons. You know, so we, most of us know some of these relationships. At the same time, you know, you can have love or you love somebody and in, in, in not even have a relationship with somebody. So love and relationships are not the same. But again, love is a, is a critical component in a relationship. But in a relationship, there are also other critical components. And that kind of explains a little more the differences. So if you have a relationship with your friend, which does not have um, uh, sexual components to it, you know, it's purely what people often you know, refer to as platonic relationships, which is not, you know, not quite, quite accurate, but it's essentially it's a relationship which contains love. You clearly love that person. You have the feelings to that person. You have the urge and the continuous effort for the well-being of, uh, for that person, but you know there's there's absolutely no sexual uh, undertone. Uh, so there are these relationships, and then there are romantic relationships where they typically do have also a sexual relationship. Uh, so these are components. So this one relationship has love, and 
And another component which I haven't mentioned is attachment. Attachment is a very powerful drive as well. So if we, and we know that, uh, if we are spending a lot of time with somebody or even something, uh, and eventually we're so used to this person or that thing, even some people get attached to, to, to things as well. And if you don't have it anymore, we miss it. And uh, everybody knows that. And, and this is uh, what's called uh, attachment. And uh, this is different from love. It's very important too, because we may have feelings because we're missing this, but it's not because of love. It's because we grew attached to somebody or something. So an attachment is also something really powerful in a relationship. And that's the reason why some people, uh, even though they don't really feel love for each other, but they have been together for so long, they, they cannot really live independently because they are attached to, to each other. So these are the, the, the key components of the relationship, attachment, love, and sexual drive. And, and so the difference between these relationships are largely that in a non-romantic relationship, they're mostly driven by love and attachment, whereas the romantic relationship, in addition to love and attachment, also have the component of sexual relationship. Now, the issue often with relationship is that folks are confused by these different emotions because all these give you emotions, sexual relationships or sexual drive, love, attachment, all of them give you emotions. You may confuse them and it makes it very difficult. And they also, in their intensity in a relationship, change over time. And you may have you know, a larger sexual impulse in the beginning, or maybe it develops later, and your love component develops later, or your attachment, obviously, is something which typically develops later in a relationship. So when they are in flux. And if they change over time, partners are maybe confused about their feelings, and so that that is something is a, a common so- source for 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 confusion. Back to your question, though, I don't think that there are different loves. I think that the the force, the drive of love, is principally the same in all of them. It is just relationships are different, and there's also differences in intensity. Clearly. So because for some people, we have stronger love and for some people, you know, it's not as strong. So the differences that we maybe perceive as different loves in my mind are different relationships and different intensities of, uh, of love, but not principally or fundamentally different mechanisms of love. Could it be also too that that love is expressed in different ways? Well, so here we get to another, uh, I think, a very important aspect, the the actual drive of love. So the, the underlying idea what love is. And then, you know, as you say, this what it does to us you know, has very different expressions. Yes. But I don't think that makes the love itself different. I think still the mechanism of what love is and, and how it, it develops and how it affects us, they're all the same. But I think, yes, then using what or these emotions, what they create in us, how we communicate them to others, they can be drastically different, yes. And that's obviously something which, again, is a, is a source of confusion and, and, and uh, potential issues among partners because people may express or communicate their feeling of love, their commitment of love to others very differently, very differently. So that is something which usually takes some time for partners to figure out, uh, say, all right, what is it, uh, what the other really is communicating? So obviously it helps quite a bit if we are trying actively and and consciously to be better communicators uh, and just like trying to understand our partner and just ask you know flat out and just say well you know i'm trying to communicate this but maybe you don't really understand it or perceive it this way so talking about this actually helps but in general yes folks you know may express their love to others very differently i mean the classic example is always the spouse who is the breadwinner happens to be the breadwinner in a relationship and and 
and works really hard and to buy gifts for the spouse and uh, and so on. That's the way you know that person feels expresses love, whereas the partner is not really that interested in all these uh, material things, but just wants the time and it's just you know feels like the other one does not devote you know the time or does not express the love the way that other person would, would like it to be expressed. I mean, that's obviously a, a cliche example, but it, it makes the point that the people you know, can express love very differently. I mean, again, I think that does not change the underlying uh, mechanism of love. I still think that, the, that love is always the same phenomenon, the same drive, but we then perceive as, as, as a result of this drive it can be expressed yeah, very, very differently and, and, and potentially lead to confusion. Absolutely, yeah. And the other thing that I've struggled with for a long time is the idea of this uh, one true love. I went back and forth on it many times, and to be honest, I'm not really sure where I'm at with it right now. But <laughs> you, did, you did make some great points about it in the book, including some points about the complexity of the human personality. Tell us a bit about that and where you're thinking on this subject of the one true love <laughs> is right now. Well, you know, I have to disclose that uh, this is obviously, you know, my opinion. I don't want to burst any bubbles. There's many people who, you know, strongly believe in this one person, in, in, in this uh, soulmate, and, and that's fine. You know, I don't want to take any, anything away from that. And it's a very romantic and it's a, it's a powerful, it's a powerful um, image. I personally believe that... Um, we are capable of having more than one big love. And, uh, and, and again, this is largely due to on our mind. If we want to believe that there's only one, well, then in our mind, it is so. But as you, as you alluded to, if you're honest, there is nobody in this world which is completely perfect. We kind of said, well, yeah, and I would say, and the first thing to say, my wife is perfect to me. She is. But if you look at every aspect of a person, there are certain things you know, which are not 100% aligned. You know, it, it's just impossible. Of so many you know, things you know, and, and traits and, 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 and characters, I would say it's impossible just to have 100% alignment on every little thing. So what I'm saying is there are certain things typically that you really uh, you feel in this person is you know the person you love and because you recognize some fundamental goodness in a person you see beauty in this person which drives your love for this this person and drives your your desire to uh, protect this person and and make make that person happy but you know there are also aspects uh, typically, which, you know, again, they're not 100% aligned. So what I'm saying is, you know, with another person, again, the fundamental similarity is that you recognize the beauty and goodness in that person, and you will not have the same kind of alignment. But there are some alignments which were you know, better with this person versus the other one. This is the nature of things. So obviously, there's this matches which are incredibly good you know i'm not saying that there are no differences uh, there are you know, big differences in in matching the agreement between between people there are certainly certain ones where you say wow you know this is just a uh, match made in heaven that's the cliche saying uh, which is you know, extraordinary well matched uh, what i would say is um, well I don't think there's anything which would be unique in the sense that uh, you could not, among 7 billion people, find a combination uh, which is uh, at least uh, a similar congruent. We like to think that, and it's because it's a romantic, it's a romantic notion. You know, it would be kind of all striving for uniqueness. You know, uniqueness is, is similar to uh, special and to precious. Uh, so it's it's a romantic notion, but I personally think there's yeah, so, so much variability in, 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 pay, in, in person's traits that you can't find uh, more than one 
excellent match. And I think it's also should be should be uh, encouraging to folks who, who, for some reason or other, lost that 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 person, and um, that there is potential for for love after love. So, why do some people love certain people but not others? Is this is this exclusively just a choice that we make and we decide that I want to give effort to this person, but not that person, but I'm absolutely capable of giving it to somebody else if I chose to. Yeah. Essentially when it comes down to in the, in the extreme form, if you look at it, it is essentially largely a choice. You know, it's largely an unconscious choice. So, if we find somebody or meet anybody, there's a lot of communication between these people, and uh, and based on this this communication, your mind creates a picture. Well, either I like this person or not, and then we have commonalities, and and to so you you put this person in a in a category in your mind among many where 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 the faults, and then if there's certain uh, characteristics, you know, we have a lot of things in common. There's uh, physical attraction, maybe also on a romantic level, etc. Then um, it forms like a, it forms our mind forms a, a, a category. Was wow, you no, know, I really like this 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 person. So a lot of these things are unconscious. You really, and they're not they're not really choices in the sense that you can have choose to like, but at the same time you can you know influence your mind and that comes back to what we said earlier so in the extreme form when you say like well love your love your enemy or love your neighbor initially you'd say no 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 this my mind says like this is a bad guy or i don't like this person but you can in your mind you know dissect that and say why do you say that you know why do you say this is not a good person and uh, and you can question that and and bring it back on a different level uh, because at the end of the day we all and that's the point of religion mostly we are all human beings a lot of things in common the the things which we we create that we are not the same is they're all largely artificial constructs in our mind and again some of them are territorial instincts, uh, there are competitive instincts. Uh, we are also very competitive beings, and this competitiveness helped us in the evolution and, and is, is critical for us because if you're not competitive, you know, you're complacent and you're not um, advancing as fast. So our competitiveness is in some way a, an obstacle to, you know, to interact with other people because very often we kind of immediately say, well, is that this person subconsciously, is this person competing with my territory or with my food source or partner, et cetera? So there's a lot of competitive instinct thinking in our mind. And uh, so, so when again, if we though, you know, mind dissect them and, and, and say, all right, no, this doesn't really apply. We can make almost everybody like. And, uh, and, and, and again, in extreme form, Jesus says, even says, well, you, you can love anybody. And that, again, is a, something which many religions say, that you can principally love anybody if you put your mind to it. Now, I believe that is true. I mean, again, the point is the, the crux of the matter is or the the catch, rather, is that uh, it is very difficult. You know, it's extremely difficult. Very few people, and that's why people like Jesus and others and the Buddha, I mean, they are very exceptional people because they were you know, a few people who were able just to get their mind to accept that, that, that they really the main thing is uh, for a human being to exist, to make them lovable. For practical purposes, though, the same principles apply but again, since the few of us are able just to have that kind of mind control, essentially it is, it happens on a lower level of intensity. So what I'm saying is that if you meet somebody, let's say you're meeting somebody for romantical uh, reasons. So you're even out there just to kind of find a partner. It helps if you at least free yourself from some of your 
conceptions and expectations uh, because many of us, we just like, well, we have uh, in our mind expectations. So, well, this person needs to be this, this, and this, and this. And we see it very clearly, particularly in the uh, dating online scene right now. It's just, uh, it is really fascinating uh, to me because it's, it's, it's almost like, you have a catalog and, and a questionnaire, right? I want to check this, check this, check this, check this. So if you do that, you know, so you're obviously restricting yourself rather and, and the restriction is in your mind. Your mind says, well, I would not date somebody who has not this characteristic. So that is something which you create in your mind. At the same time, you're also capable of unchecking that box if you get your mind to it. You know, you may say like, well, I cannot do that. Yes, you can. It just may, you know, may take effort. And many people don't, may, don't, may not want to do that. And that's fine. That's their decision, obviously. I'm not telling anybody to do it a certain way. But I'm, what I'm saying is the more you allow your, your mind to lead these kind of requirements, the more you open yourself to other human beings and you maybe see get to see the aspects of, of people which you kind of uh, would not have seen if you had yourself restricted so much it is striking that, that many relationships start when you spend time with people so the workplace is a very common place for people to to start relationships and and that is because when you spend time with somebody, you learn, you see the attractive features of somebody, which are their goodness, that's their, their good ways. You would not typically see that if you just don't give people the chance and then just look through them in, like in, a, in a catalog fashion and, 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 and want to have certain criteria met. But if you spend time with them, then you see their, their good ways and, and you start feeling you know being attracted to these uh, to this to this goodness so in a way it is a choice uh, in many ways it's not a conscious choice but again you can make it a choice it comes again down to the same principles that we have the power the, the, the power is there but it's challenging and uh, when if we want to we can apply it and we can help or, or, or cause. Now, we also don't have to, and I think that's one part where particularly my earlier point of, of criticism was with Fromm book, we don't have to be so an intellectual and analytical. We can say, all right, well, we just use it on a, on, a, on, a, on a smaller level, but maybe just open our mind to some degree. It's up to us. So there's no need just to become as powerful as, as many spiritual leaders in terms of controlling our, our thoughts and uh, our mind. But it does help if we're freeing our minds from some of these restrictions. And I think that's probably something most of us can, can benefit from. Absolutely. And let's tie love back into your day job. What are the consequences of love or a lack of love on our mental and physical health? What have you seen just in your own experience? I mean, can you identify if somebody is suffering from broken heart syndrome or you know something like a lack of love in their life? Well, yeah, um, there's no doubt. There's a lot of scientific evidence now that love or the lack of love has uh, profound effects on our health. There are lots of studies now showing that you are in loving relationships, you're less often sick, and vice versa. If you are, don't have loving relationships, you know, you or there's even data that you don't live as long, that you're more prone to sickness, and people are now getting closer to understanding the interactions of, of love with our immune system. So yeah, there's, there's no doubt that those who are loving and focus on love, have loving relationships that they are better that are better off in, in terms of health. In my field of, of cardiology, yeah, there was something which got a lot of attention a few years ago, which is called the, 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 the broken heart syndrome, which is really fascinating because we didn't know about this uh, 20 years ago. And I remember vividly that during my training that we had cases particularly affecting more women than men 
they came and had all signs of an acute heart attack, and we would rush them to the heart catheterization laboratory to because we were convinced that they had a blocked heart artery which need to be opened, and they never had any. And we're like, we're puzzled. Well, how come that these people have all signs of a heart attack, but they really don't have uh, the heart attack like you know like we typically see, but there's a blood clot occluding a heart artery. And so what we found out is that uh, in these circumstances, the person had some kind of emotional event, be it as something traumatic happened to uh, you know, one person, for instance, there, there was a fire in the house and it was really scared about the the loved one, which was was still left in the house, so it was in very strong emotional distress, and and and, and, and essentially had this this symptom where the heart muscle all of a sudden would not work well. And then another person lost uh, a partner of many years and was devastated, and uh, a few weeks later came with with the same symptoms that the heart muscle would not work well, and uh, so we found out. That, yeah, these very strong emotional states would cause essentially a, a such high levels of adrenaline in, in the heart muscle that would lead to, to damaging the heart muscle cells and the, the patient actually got heart failure. So it is a, it is a new entity of, uh, yeah, again, which we've been only knowing about the last uh, decade or so. But it kind of shows what kind of powerful influence emotions have, uh, and they can cause like a serious, serious condition. And, and this is a condition you can die from. Uh, fortunately, if you treat it well, uh, initially most people their heart muscle function you know improves you know, dramatically within a few days and weeks. But uh, it, it can be it, it can be deadly. So yes, strong. Emotions, uh, they can have an immediate powerful effect on our health, but long-term relationships also are clearly shown to have an effect on, on our life expectancy and on our probability to, to become sick. Yeah, and sort of related, can we actually identify whether it's through, you know, maybe sort of mapping the brain or mapping the heart or mapping maybe even the gut? Can we identify... When somebody experiences love, like if they're actually in real time feeling, I guess you could identify it based on the release of those certain transmitters, right? Well, yeah, the transmitters you can you can assess in what kind of state somebody is. You know, particularly if uh, if somebody just fell in love, you know, there are certain your blood levels they're like they are elevated, so you can say that. But but you can also minute to minute changes in your brain you can track with brain imaging, you know, particularly called functional MRI imaging, you can see the activities in certain parts of the brain. So what people do is they put the people in a scanner and then they show them pictures of the loved ones and they show them other pictures and you can see, really, it's, it's fascinating uh, how these certain areas in the brain uh, light up, so to say. Uh, so you can track these activities. Yeah, no, we, we can now you know, pretty well see at least once, once for, for, for the time being, you know, where you are in, in a scanner, uh, what's happening in our brain, whether you feel loving or not. Uh, so these processes are becoming better and better uh, understood now. And obviously they're very complex. Uh, so we do know that certain hormones are particularly implicated in long-term relationships and uh, how they're formed. And but again, I think the key thing is that how these hormones are released or depend a lot on on our mindset. So that, that comes first. You know, if we kind of get our mind to, to focus on love and loving relationship, uh, then these things will follow. So I think the key point again is that we have a lot more control. Uh, at least a lot more potential control. It is just again that we are not doing it. You know, we didn't, we're not really taking control, largely because a we are not cognizant of it. We're not aware that we have this control. But b also because it is difficult to obtain that control. 
In the book, too, you said that love is a form of energy. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, it's clear that um, when we love somebody, that something happens, you know, between if you, if you, you know, the two people and they're loving each other, there is something which seems to go back and forth, you know, which is hard to put in words and it's hard to capture, but it seems that there is something there which nurtures the other one, makes the other person more secure, content, and really is instrumental for the well-being of the other. And uh, But yet, and again, it's, it's difficult just to capture this, what actually is happening between these uh, individuals. Uh, and so it is, you know, we, obviously our understanding of things is limited, you know, so who knows what, what actually is, is happening at that time uh, on, on a different kind of level of uh, beyond our current comprehension. But it's striking, you know, it's, it, everybody knows, uh, experience this, knows that this is, uh, this, this is very powerful, striking, and it doesn't even uh, dissipate with somebody, even after somebody passed. You know, we all know that you know, somebody we love dearly and has passed away, that we're still feeling this, this energy when we, really, when, we, when we think of that person. And that uh, that this this comes back, uh, and uh, so again, I I cannot really. This is something beyond our current understanding and and, and analysis. Uh, but there is there seems to be something beyond what we currently can capture, uh, which which is happening between individuals who who love each other. You know, I have a mantra that I repeat at the end of every show, and the first part of it is to love yourself. I say that at the end of every episode, but I've had some pretty intense debates about self-love being selfish and not selfless. And I guess it is. I mean, it might be the very definition of selfish, but I don't think it's necessarily selfishness. But how would you describe self-love and the importance of self-love? Yeah, I'm glad that you bring it up because it's, yeah, it's, it could not be more important to to recognize that love includes includes yourself you you got to have love for yourself because the reason for love is the same as for for other individuals so you need to recognize your inherent value and goodness as a person and so you know, we are all not different in that regard from anybody else. You know, and the key aspect of, of what I believe is within love is the recognition of goodness in somebody, the, the value, the preciousness in, in a person. And, uh, and that should apply to ourselves too. And, and that has, in my mind, nothing to do with selfishness. Selfishness is if you act such that you're prioritizing your own needs predominantly over other needs, particularly in situations where it is uh, very appropriate just to to consider you know, everybody's uh, needs in the situation. So, you no know, selfishness and, and self-love are very different concepts uh, in my mind. And uh, but but self-love is extremely important because if we don't accept and love ourselves. It is a source for tremendous, tremendous internal struggle and conflicts, which almost makes it impossible to love others. So because for the mind, it is so devastating that for not accepting us, that, that our mind is then, if we are in a position where we question ourselves and don't feel worth to be loved, that then our mind is constantly busy just trying to find or recreate its balance. So our lives are largely about balance. Everything needs to be in balance. That, that happens from the smallest molecule in, in the cell. Every, every or entire universe is, is about balance. And, and when we question our, our own self in terms of its values, then 
we are deeply out of balance and, uh, and our mind will just try just to find confirmation for its value elsewhere. So we'll constantly look for outside sources as well. Is there a sign, you know, is this a sign that I am valuable, that I deserve love? And so what happens then is this, this awful circle where people trying to get self-affirmation from outside sources, from other people, from the things they do, their work or their art, etc. And it becomes this almost obsessive engagement uh, and, and, and really makes it difficult for the mind to devote time and focus towards others. And even though I'm not saying that these people, you know, or not capable of, of having feelings for others, they do. But the ability to to sustain that effort is limited because the mind constantly pulls these folks back and kind of say, well, what about me? You know, I, I need to be self-affirmed. And again, it's it's a gigantic struggle for for this mind. Uh, and while everybody already, and I, I said like earlier, we all struggle with the concept that our mind is is seeking is, is rather distracted easily by other activities, and uh, that is by by baseline already a struggle. But if you have a mind which is so preoccupied by sustaining its self value, essentially a perception of self value, it is very very difficult. But unfortunately, that is one of the factors which are most prevalent and is most common, the most common source of struggle in relationship. So that's why I mean, I'm glad that, you, that we get to talk about it, that without self-acceptance and self-love, it is really difficult to have a meaningful long-term relationship. Uh, so it is almost that you have to start there. Uh, not almost. You, you've got to start there and develop a sense of who you are, what you want to be, and, and of your value in this world. So that's, that's really critical. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to hear, Ryan, that, that you're making this a mantra for each of your show because yeah, it, it cannot be over, overemphasized how important it is to, to get to that point where you, you know, accept yourself. And people, you know, it's, it's a cliche as well. You have to accept your faults and, but it is so true. You know, if you don't, you can say it, but if you don't believe it, that it's okay that, you know, you're not perfect, that you have flaws. And, and, and I can say it from a personal standpoint. It took me a long time to get to that point. It was not easy just to, for me to accept, well, I have strength, but I have also weaknesses and that's okay. Uh, I'm not perfect. I do fail frequently. And uh, but all what I can do is to to do my best. You know, I try to do my best, and and beyond that, you know, you you have to be able to forgive yourself. You know, for the things you don't do well, and because there are things you know you were not going to do well. So I think I think it's very very important. I'm, I'm glad you you mentioned that. Just following up on that point, then. You know, there are a lot of external stressors that hinder our ability to fully love and accept ourselves. And I think they really sort of get implanted into us in childhood, you know, like the expectations of our parents or the expectations of our social groups, you know, maybe the biggest factors here, you know, like you have to reach a certain level of academic standing, you have to get a certain type of job with a certain level of salary. I mean, it feels like we're constantly being pushed to pursue this material success instead of a a real sort of holistic, you know, self success, if that makes sense. But these sorts of pressures and expectations, you know, constantly pursuing money or status, they can contribute to low self-esteem and a negative self-image. So I guess, you know, I'm just wondering from your perspective, how can we first actually recognize if we have low self-esteem and then what can we do about it? Well, you're absolutely right. You know, our, our society is almost set up to, to make us feel this way because of the focus on material gains and, uh, I just, you know, I have children and, and some of them are still in school and I just, I'm just really shocked, you know, how much work these kids have to do. They're spending so much focus on, on their, on their academics and just from, from young on, they basically 
looking uh, to the next steps academically and it's so competitive and it is it's amazing to me how people actually uh, break out of this. So. so the answer is it is it is very difficult and obviously as you say it depends a lot on the lock of the draw if you have parents who you know make you aware of this and just and say well you know what you know it's, academia is not everything in this world and uh, if you early on get these children to kind of give them different perspectives about other important things in life then it obviously it makes it easier for them to see and to you know, to have the introspection to see that they have to find balance in their life if on the other hand you know you have an environment which buys into the whole concept and to say well you know it's the most important thing for me is to, to bring A's and that you will get to Harvard, etc. Then obviously the children make it, for them it's much harder just to get out of this, and then because all what they know is academic achievements, etc. So a lot of this is, as you say, is the environment, and there's nothing easy to to do other than obviously for us just to spread the the message that we we are interested in a more balanced society. Uh, but if you ask now specifically, what can a person do? The person can try to to reflect, you know, and, and trying to broaden the horizon and then read. You know, this if reading is very powerful, there's a lot of uh, great literature out there just to kind of get your mind on something something else, take time out. I like to see now more and more folks now uh, in college they, they take a gap year after college, say, all right, well let's think about a little bit about what I want to do. I think it's very important just to set some time aside, just not to to think about academia or, or economics and just like, you know, thinking about what life is about. You know, so in that regard, uh, the fading influence of religion is is is, uh, is tough, you know, because uh, there used to be, and I'm not saying you need religion per se, you know, but it was at least one one component of life which at least got you to think a little bit outside the very uh, strict curriculum. So the key message is just to find ways to set aside you know, with other activities other than academia or, or work, just to, to think, think about life outside these parameters. So I've also heard some people say that love is a religion. It's their religion. What do you think of that? Could we consider love a religion? Well, it you know obviously depends on what you are, uh, how do you find, define religion. Uh, I personally think that a focus on love has many of the same concepts uh, of uh, religion. Because and again, if you look at any, any religion, love is centerpiece of it. In, and we can talk about it obviously in extent about why that is, but but the essence is that that it seems to be a realization that uh, again that love is central to human existence, and by by promoting loving relationships, that we're getting to a state in life which is close to what we perceive as ideal, meaning like you know content, peaceful, uh, living in harmony. And um, the criticism that many people expressed before me, but but with I, but which I share, is that religion often comes with the confinements of a construct, which is essentially arbitrary. It was established at some point, and then it will, was continued, and it often it was established many centuries ago, and it contains confinements which many would say have not kept up with the changes of time but still often they are being reinforced uh, which then they create a conflict with the with the actual purpose of these religions so, so there's a lot of conflicts and i think many people would also would agree and, and it's the reason why they left religions uh, because they felt like the ideas are good but what what the institution or mate or or done with it is is not really in agreement anymore with with people and i think that's true and and the, so the I, the idea of uh, love as a religion is to say well well we don't need 
a construct or an institution around it. If, if love is really the essence of all religions, why can't we just you know, focus on love and then we don't have these, these other issues? So the idea is just, well, uh, all we, what we have to do is just to focus on the practice of love, meaning that you know, looking at, at each individual person and to treat that person with as much love we can generate. And if we do that, then we have exactly what all these religions essentially ask for or, or, or preach. I mean, it comes to a very similar uh, state. And similar to these religions, the, the process getting there is difficult. We talked about it. But uh, akin to religions, you know, we, we engage in practice and it can be done together, but it can be done on our own to uh, foster this attitude towards uh, towards others. So in that regard, I think love is really the essence of religions and can be regarded as as such itself. Yeah, and speaking of religion, there are some that practice polygamy. Where do you stand on that in relation to love? Is it possible to have multiple romantic, loving relationships with different people at the same time? Well, what I would say is that in theory, you can. If you are able to love, you know, these people or several people at the same time equally or at least to the extent that they require, I would say, again, it, it can be possible, or at least in theory, it can be possible. But in practical aspects, it can be possible. It's a different story. But I cannot be the judge of it. I, I've never you know, seen a, a relationship to, to assess whether it works or not uh, in terms for everybody involved. I would say that, you know, that the monogamy is, is something I endorse and uh, I practice, but I would not say it has to be the form of a relationship which, you know, everybody needs to, needs to be, uh, abide to the same rules. So I think, again, the, the issues are there that the, the, the relationships and love are different. And that as long as you are able to to have the loving relationship even among more than two, it's possible. I would think it is difficult uh, just because of the dynamics and uh, of more than two. It's already hard to maintain a relationship between two people, as we know, uh, because of the the dynamics within a relationship between two people, uh, within the, these individuals, the dynamics over time. Uh, so it is already very challenging to have a relation between two people over a long period of time. So I would think it is more challenging to have that with three or more people. But again, I wouldn't say it is saying it's impossible or it shouldn't be done. But uh, I think I think it would be it would be challenging. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that too. It's it's hard to take out the uh, just the human emotion, you know, jealousy or territorialism. It's just very hard to get past those things. So yeah, I mean, I've never really seen it successfully implemented into somebody's life, at least who I know. And I'm wondering, you did mention this in the book. I'm wondering though, what are the similarities between creativity and love? Do they have similarities? I guess. I think I think they do because. Um... When you are creative, and it doesn't have to be art per se, it can be. And you know, art is obviously an impression of creativity. But anything you do, even skills, if you, you create like a, you build something. I mean, this is something you devote your mind to it, and you you also put some some love into this because it's this is part of you. When you create something, it's part of who you are. So you have a connection. With whatever you created, and in the process, uh, I think has has similarities because you know you focus on something, you giving you giving something is a giving process, and you want to create something, you also have that you know typically you have that aspect of it. You want to preserve that what you created. You know, did you feel attached to it? So it is an impression or an expression, I should say, of um, of something that you hold some value for it so i think i think there is there is some there's some parallels there so and you know, maybe that's the reason why people also they are uh, find a lot of satisfaction with creating something and with with art 
because you really give something of yourself, uh, which then continues to be, to some extent, part of, of, of you. You know, the last question for you I have, I mean, is, you know, back to the, the central idea of the book that love is an art. And an art is, a, as you say it is in the book, a skillful human activity undertaken to express a person's perceptions and emotions. And I think that we've established that love is indeed an art. I am wondering, though, how do we actually, and this probably goes back to the self-love stuff, but how do we actually generate love in ourselves? Are we able to teach others how to love themselves? And I guess the bigger question is, how do we master this art? Yeah, yeah. It is... Uh... It is essentially you master it by by uh, constantly being mindful of what happens in in your mind uh, in, in gently redirecting your focus on loving activities and uh, discouraging your mind being distracted by not loving activities i mean that's in a nutshell how you do it uh, or how you master it. And so the levels which are involved is obviously first gaining awareness. Uh, so what you do is, uh, and it can be done in a meditation format, but it doesn't. Uh, you can just pick like a few minutes e each day and say, well, I just want to see what's happening in my mind and uh, being, being mindful of this and then trying to, to monitor, monitor what are your thoughts. Uh, and uh, when you do something, that can be expanded, uh, ex extended for any activity in your, in your day. It's like, all right, just can maybe uh, set a timer for every hour for one minute and just like remind yourself, all right, what am I thinking right now? Um, what am I doing? What are my priorities right now? Uh, so it, it may be just cumbersome in the beginning or arduous in the beginning, but after a while, you find yourself that it becomes very natural to you that you are having these moments uh, more and more during the day to say, oh, did you be aware of what is it, what you're thinking, what are your priorities are? And then you kind of start recognizing what your mind is doing, or whether your mind is kind of saying, well, you know, you want to do this or this, or whether your mind is actively concerned about your, your loved ones. And uh, so by that, over, over time, you're becoming more and more just naturally in tune with becoming, you know, essentially less self-centered, but more oriented towards what it takes to make, you know, others uh, uh, happy and uh, and well. And uh, so it's a process. Uh, it 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 uh, and, and it takes essentially in the beginning some discipline, but again, I think over time it become it become easier. And so it's it's essentially practicing practicing self awareness and mindfulness so if you want to do if you want to pursue a little faster on the track you obviously you put in more time you know if you spend uh, every day uh, 20 minutes in the in the morning and 20 minutes at night you know meditating or praying or doing similar activities you're getting you're getting there faster the key thing is the consistency these things these things that don't change within a few days or weeks just because, you know, we make these uh, changes uh, after many decades of our mind uh, having certain patterns. Now, you're not going to change these patterns easily. Uh, so the key thing is just to stay with it. And that's maybe that's why it's important not to kind of overwhelm you in the beginning and just say, well, maybe just one minute every hour, uh, waking hour, where you kind of remind yourself, or you just do it even less than that. Uh, but the thing is just to have it you know, regularly, regularly over time, because then eventually it will it will sink in. And uh, I think people will be amazed how what an impact it, it will have, even if you do it just on a small scale in in the beginning. It's very hard to disagree with that. So before we go here, please tell people where they can find the book if they're interested in picking it up. Oh sure, yeah. It's you know, it's still it's still on Amazon. So or what any major bookstore? I think uh, the major sources. Yes, and there's a website also with the same uh, same name. Uh, so I very much welcome. Obviously, comments. Uh, there's a blog there and uh, discussions uh, because 
this is what uh, at least I think makes makes us interesting you know, to have different perspectives. Uh, this is obviously always this is works in progress. This is something which is going to develop over time, and uh, and and inputs from from different sources will will develop these concepts. Absolutely. And I mean, there's so much here in the book and just in general on the subject. I mean, we could talk for a couple more hours and I'd love to have you back sometime if you're interested. And I should tell you too that I picked up a few extra copies of the book to give to some people I know that I think could get some benefit. Thank you, man. (laughs) No problem. Yeah, it's the least I can do, you know, so. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I'd be, of course, happy to to be back anytime. As you say, there's there's a lot of uh, things to talk about. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we really just scratched the surface, you know, trying to sort of, uh, I guess, we just tried to lay a foundation here for what love is and what it means and why it matters. And I think we did that. So, Dr. Amin Zadeh. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Best of luck to you in the future and much love to you and yours as well. Thank you, Ryan. It's been a pleasure and uh, all, all the best to you as well. Thank you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Amin Zadeh. There are just a few simple things that bring me real joy and ecstasy in this life. And one of them is allowing myself to be completely absorbed into the passion of another person through the energetic current that they create. That's a tricky game to play because wading through that current can sometimes take us places we don't want or need to be. But when the moment is right, when the essence is right, and you'll know when it is, goddamn, there are a few better feelings in the world than that. And I get that feeling whenever I can have a legitimate and serious heart-to-heart conversation with someone about love and relationships and the nature of that part of the human experience. And the nature of this conversation, which I thought was simplistic and therefore accessible to a a wider audience. That's refreshing when you hold it up against other episodes on this show and against other podcasts in this genre. I mean, at the end of the day, most of this is pretty trivial and pretty insignificant. I mean, does your natal chart really matter? No, not really. Does the shape of the earth or the nature of UFOs really matter? No, not really. Do your politics matter? Some of you will hate me for this, but no, not really. I mean, is this stuff interesting? Is it thought-provoking? Fuck yes, it is. And we'll continue to explore those kinds of topics. Well, maybe not the shape of the earth, but we'll continue to explore these things like only we can explore them together, raw, and unfiltered. That is the absolute best way. It's the only way to experience it. Hey, what a uh, wonderful year this has been for me and hopefully for you as well. I've made so much progress uh, in my character, in my personality, and have seen tremendous growth and maturation in some areas I definitely needed to grow and mature in. Still a lot of work to do in those areas and in some others. That job is never done. But I have noticed some progress, and that's all I can ask for. And I hope you too have been able to grow and mature in whatever areas you know you need growth and maturation in as well. And one area I suspect we could all do better in, back to the theme of the chat, is love. You know, love is exploited and sold just like anything else in our culture. It's probably a trillion dollar industry when you consider all the ways it's marketed and sold, whether it's through film and TV, or ways to enhance your physical appearance and so on. And because it's marketed and sold to us, it becomes a commodity to us on some level. Something we have to have, but something we're searching for in all the wrong places. Something we're trying to acquire and hold on to as long as it remains valuable to us. Instead of curating and nurturing it so that it not only grows organically within us, but so we can responsibly teach others how to love without draining and also exploiting ourselves in the process. Obviously, we're getting ready to turn the page on another year here together, at least based on the control mechanism that is recorded time. And most of you will be celebrating such an occasion with friends and family, partners and spouses, and obviously do that responsibly as well. But when it comes time to think about what you wish to do differently in 2019, remember that expressing your love or your adoration or any other sort of positive sentiment that you know someone else would appreciate hearing and sharing with you, remember that that expression is communicated in four key ways. Words of affirmation, performing acts of service, physical touch, and spending quality time together. So tell someone you love them, do something nice for them that you know they'll appreciate, hug them, kiss them, fuck them if you're into that sort of thing. But most of all, make time for them. Spend time with them. Because you never know how many more calendars you're going to turn the page on. That said, Happy New Year. Be kind, be loving, be safe, and most importantly, be yourself. Thank you.
please rewind this cassette.